Welcome to Mastara, where today I'm responding to several requests I've gotten over the years with the powers of my imagination. It's time to talk about the creation of Mastara, the world, going all the way back to the beginning. This question has been asked by several people who got started in D&D &D late and were led to believe that the 4th edition versions of events was the way it always was. That's when I had to explain the magic word for today was retcon. A few naysayers, to put it nicely, have criticized Mastara because it doesn't mesh with the current standard set by the realms. Even though that setting stole the Dawn War from Nintir Vale, because Faerun's got a Faerun, I guess. I said at the beginning of this channel I was going to try to fill in missing history when I could, so here's my big chance. I'm Mr. Welch, and we're going back to the beginning. A quick summary of the Dawn War that became canon in 4th and 5th edition is that the cruel and capricious Oberiths, a race of super demons, drove the god Therizdin mad and started a war between his primordials and the other gods. The primordials were living embodiments of chaos, capable of massive destruction and caring little for those caught in the middle. The gods, of course, are selfish and worship-addicted creatures, and fight to save mortals, as without mortals the gods would perish. The war ravages for untold years, with entire planets destroyed and new races created specifically just to fight in the Dawn War on behalf of the self-absorbed deities. But there was another faction that saw the destruction and grew disgusted with both sides. The enigmatic Old Ones. No one knows what they actually are, they don't seek worshippers like the egotistical gods, and they have no need of mortal souls like the evil fiends. If they have a goal, they aren't saying. It is speculated that the Lady of Pain and the City of Sigil might be an Old One. In fact, she might be the face of the Old Ones, there to keep an eye on the various factions of the Plains. The Old Ones saw the slaughter that was being caused by the Dawn War, and they wanted nothing to do with it. They decided that the hierarchy of gods was not working. Something new must be tried. No longer will mortals be ruled over by creatures that only need them for their own selfish reasons. Now, mortals will be ruled over by only the best of their number, the Ascended Immortals. The Old Ones began sectioning off a portion of the multiverse using magics of unheard of power. The new region was devoid of life, not even a planet capable of sustaining life was present. They began erecting the Great Barrier around this section of space. It was invisible to the eye, but it served a vital purpose to their needs. The barrier kept out the gods and primordials that were destroying the rest of the universe. The barrier wasn't impassable, but the greater a creature's strength was, the more difficult it was to breach the barrier. A single imp might feel a tinge of pain passing through this magical screen, while Ao the Overgod might as well be trying to punch through a wall made entirely of stale fruitcake. The barrier extended across planes. The Old Ones knew their creation would need the building blocks of creation, so the barrier claimed parts of the elemental planes as well as the ethereal plane and parts of the positive and negative energy planes. The Old Ones were helped in this endeavor by elemental creatures of vast power who were also tired of their realms being turned into battlefield by creatures that didn't even care about the destruction they wrought. These four elemental lords provided the Old Ones with all the help they needed. In exchange, they became the first elemental immortals, the Elemasters. As the power of the barrier grew, other creatures and gods began to notice the creation and realize that a large portion of the multiverse was about to be sealed off. The gods began a mad scramble to try and breach the barrier because if it reached full power, it would cut off the greedy gods from worshippers, whose devotion they demanded, lest the mortals realized they didn't need gods. By this time, the barrier was strong enough to repulse any deities that tried to break through. A few gods took a different strategy, realizing the barrier was designed to stop divine creatures. Instead, they sent avatars through the forming worlds inside the new region. Of these, Thor and Hell were the first to try it, and were able to manifest inside the new region before the barrier grew strong enough to prevent even avatars from crossing over. A few demon lords, such as Orcus and Demogorgon, and even a great old one in the form of Zargon, sent shards of their selves through the incomplete barrier. These avatars and shards would later become immortals in their own right, cut off from the power of their original deity, though. In the Feywild, the Dawn War ravaged the land of the Fey folk unchecked. As both powers realized, the eternal nature of the Fey meant the goodly folk were an internal source of warriors that could be instantly reborn if they fell in battle. While the gods demanded the subservience of the Fey, a few of the crueler gods like Corellian and Lorathian felt the Fey were not enough and twisted several of them into his pet race, the Elves. Now he had an entire species that owed their existence to him and him alone, giving him the praise that he would need to survive for all time. But there were a few of the goodly folk that grew tired of the war and the ravages of the god. A powerful she-lord named Oberon approached the Old Ones and promised to use the power of the Feywild to strengthen the barrier against the gods and primordials that were demanding entry to the forming region free of the Dawn War. His one demand? That the Old Ones take him and all who swore fealty to him into the New Realm safe from the machinations of the Seldarine, who demanded more soldiers for their genocidal war. The Old Ones agreed, and when Lorathian returned to harvest more Fey to convert into Elves, he found himself standing face to face with Oberon. But the god discovered he could not claim the upstart Fey. 
he could not even take one step forward because the Great Barrier prevented him from stealing any more fairy folk to pervert into cannon fodder for his pointless war. The last he saw of that region of the Feywild before it was torn from his grasp and removed from the Dawn War was a mocking Oberon waving goodbye with a rude gesture. At that very moment, Oberon himself ascended into the first Archfey, the eternal Ardry of the now independent Good Kingdom. The time that it took to create the Great Barrier cannot be measured by mortal means. Time is no meaning to beings that powerful. It might have taken eons or thousands of millennia. But all the while, the Dawn War raged. The planet of Toril was cleansed of life when the Primordials destroyed its sun. Athis saw its gods destroyed and the defiling magic of the Primordials ravaged the planet. Entire worlds were created and destroyed during this time. But inside the Great Barrier, new plants were being created and life was forming on its own without the corrupting influence of the gods or the fiends. During this period, the realm that the dead passed through to reach the afterlife was destroyed by the warring factions. The Great Barrier began to trap the souls of the dead, keeping them from reaching the heavens or the hells. This included the avatar of the gods and the fiends that had entered before the Great Barrier was at its full strength. Unable to reach a proper afterlife, the souls trapped inside the Great Barrier began the process of reincarnation, always returning to a new form as soon as it became available. It was during this time that the first immortals ascended on their own. Ka and Koratiku were some of the first, elevated from sentient animals that emerged on the planet that is now Mastara. The avatars of Odin and Hel found themselves cut off from their divine origins, unable to contact their original forms, and found themselves merely powerful mortals. But they were able to reach immortality through their own merits. Hel, in particular, found herself trapped in a world not of her own making, and wanted changes that were not going to be made. Thus, she created the Sphere of Entropy, swearing to tear all of creation down inside the Great Barrier and rebuild it in her own particular way. The newly created immortals began to realize the full extent of their powers. The region inside the Great Barrier was vast, but empty. The old ones, however, had given the immortals the power to create, and create they did. New solar systems and universes were given form inside the Great Barrier. As the barrier extended across numerous planes, the immortals could create entire systems where the natural laws of the prime material plane could be shaped to their desires. Adding to the explosion of life was Oberon and the Archfey of the Good Kingdom. Archfey cannot create like the Immortals can, but they can alter the world with their magic far easier. In addition, they remembered the time before the Great Barrier, and several sylvan creatures that came with them ascended to immortality and began recreating the lost races in Mastara. The trained Ordana ascended before the rise of man and created the race of elves that would spread across Mastara. These elves could live and develop on their own without fear of the retaliation of the Seldarine for refusing to be their lackeys. Other races, such as dragons, dwarves, hen, and gnomes, joined the races of Mastara gradually over the years. The gods did not stand idly by while life sprouted on other worlds, owing no allegiance to them. The goddess Tiamat, through sacrificing an incomprehensible number of dragons, demons, and mortals, opened up a brief hold in the Great Barrier. This started the Dragon War, as Tiamat demanded the worship that she is due, or she would burn the planet to ash. The resulting war would pit dragon against dragon until she was finally expelled at great cost defeated by the Great Old One and the other dragon immortals. A small portion of the barrier was opened through the sacrifice of most of the metallic dragons, as Tiamat herself was torn apart by the Old One and his allied immortals. The hole in the barrier cast Tiamat's soul back to her home plane to lick her wounds. This resulted in the metallic dragons in Mastara, save for the gold dragons, which were fighting elsewhere, to become all but extinct. This was also the reason for the foundation of the Council of Intrusion. If another god was to try something so brazen as enter Mastara, it would face all the immortals, rather than just four. Because the Great Barrier limited travel to the Mastara realms from the outer planes, including the astral plane, foul creatures that plague other realms never manifested on Mastara. The Illithid were cut off, their nautiloids unable to breach the barrier. Aboliths likewise found the effort to pass through the barrier too difficult to make it worth their time. While Mastara did create many of the more numerous races across the multiverse for a variety of reasons, Many times it developed races endemic to just its lands. The immortals created their races to stand alone, thus hybrid races never developed. Merging two races required immortal magics rather than just a simple roll in the hay. This has led to some unusual families as mortals of mixed blood can still produce children of either race, depending entirely on the ancestry of the other parent. The Great Barrier is not a physical manifestation. Mortals that pass through it will never even know it. It cannot be detected by magic. It's not visible by any being short of gods or immortals. It's so vast in scope, not even the immortals know the exact area that it encompasses. It's speculated that the barrier grows every time an immortal creates a new realm. It crosses over into the inner planes, but not into the outer planes. Fiends or celestials can cross through it, but at great cost of their physical form. However, immortals can use their magic to allow outside creatures from entering without harm. 
the barrier goes both ways. Getting in is very difficult. Getting out is no more difficult than it would be in Greyhawk or Birthright. Immortals can travel to other planes of existence with no effort. This is how many entropic immortals will recruit demons for their own needs. And occasionally celestials and devils will broker a deal for temporary passage with other immortals. Immortals know when the Great Barrier is breached by lesser creatures. This is how the Council of Intrusion is alerted to possible threats entering Mastara. The Council will then decide how to deal with the intruder, usually through their immortal agents known as the Knights of Ebony. Thus, Mastara was saved from the Dawn War that devastated entire worlds and killed incalculable number of mortals. Is any of this canon? No, not in the slightest. I was asked to try and fit Mastara's square peg into 5e lore's round hole. Use this as you see fit. It's all lore. It's probably never going to come up in an actual game. Of course, with the time travel that's a major part of the setting, it's not impossible. Next week, we are looking at one of the darker sides of Mastara, slavery. It's found in more nations than not, so who are these slaves? Who's enslaving them? And who's trying to set them free? But until next week, suck it, Corellian.